Hello, I'm up. I'm Vincent McCory in for Hashtag of the Year. Today is Tuesday, August the 17th. This is Africa 54. Burkina Faso's internally displaced persons struggle to access aid. Among the Afghan diaspora in the United States, Fear and anger is high as the Taliban takes over. And overcoming hurdles in Kenya's gold medal region. A recent report found that community leaders in Burkina Faso are exploiting internally displaced women, demanding sex or money in return for food aid. One local official says this reported incident could be the tip of the iceberg in a displacement crisis of 1.3 million people. Reporter Henry Wilkins spoke to a victim in this report from the town of Kaya. In Burkina Faso's humanitarian crisis, food is in scarce supply. Internally displaced people, or IDPs, at this unofficial camp in the centre-north region, so they do not receive food aid from the state or non-profits. This woman, whose identity we have protected, resides in a host community for IDPs. She says she's been forced to take desperate measures in order to eat. <laughs> We stayed in our shelters for six months without even a basic amount of food, unless you have sex with the people distributing the food or prostitute yourself or go in the town begging. A lot of women were contracting sexual diseases. I had to survive until my husband returned and we rented a small house. A report last month by the New Humanitarian, a media outlet focusing on humanitarian issues, found that eight IDPs had been forced into sex in exchange for food aid in the centre-north region. From the reporting I did with the women that I spoke to and aid officials uh, and government officials, it seemed like everyone knew that this was happening. Uh, few people were, were really willing to talk about it. The women that I spoke to said that they knew other women who had also registered for food, were having a hard time finding food assistance, and thought that they were being propositioned in the same way that, that they had been, either for sex uh, or for money in order to add their names to the registration list. The report also said an inter-non-profit system to prevent and address sexual exploitation and abuse is not fully set up. An official from a town with a large IDP population who spoke on condition of anonymity told VOA the size of the sex for food scandal is likely much bigger than has been reported. There are so many women who approach us about this. I can't give an exact number but I would say it must be between 20 and 30 displaced women. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, which provides much of the aid, refused to give an on-camera interview, but did respond to questions via email. Asked why the system for preventing cases of sex for food aid had not been properly set up, they said, the government of Burkina Faso, supported by the UN, has a toll-free number for filing complaints in all cases of sexual or gender-based abuse. Focal points are in place to detect any sign of sexual abuse or exploitation, and humanitarian and other workers are trained on their responsibilities and accountability. Burkina Faso's Ministry for Humanitarian Affairs did not respond to VOA's request for comment. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Kaya, Burkina Faso. Volunteers in Kenya are working to counter misinformation on the coronavirus uh, among people living with HIV. The virus that causes AIDS, social media posts have been circulating harmful false claims that, use, uh, that the use of antiretroviral drugs to treat HIV can also prevent and even cure COVID-19. Victoria Munga reports from Nairobi. 
The Kenya AIDS Non-Governmental Organization Consortium Kanko has been hosting regular forums to educate HIV patients on preventing coronavirus infections. The group says the need came because of false claims in social media that antiretroviral drugs used to treat HIV also prevent or even cure COVID-19. They are like uh, COVID is a, a virus and uh, HIV on its own is a virus itself. So they are like, if these drugs are antiviral, why aren't they covering up for, I mean, why, why are they covering up for the HIV alone? So me, I tend to believe if I'm on ARV for HIV, the same same drug can work on the COVID, COVID. and uh, that's a very, very big misconception on the same. HIV patient Jen, not her real name, has been using antiretroviral drugs, ARVs, for five years. She fell for social media claims that ARVs will protect her from COVID, partly because she was afraid to take the vaccine. I am now ready to take the vaccine because we went in for training where we were educated that the moment you get vaccinated, your chances of getting COVID are lower than the one who isn't vaccinated. Kenyan authorities are campaigning to counter the falsehood through community sensitization and media. We've been um, especially using our social media pages to try and highlight frequently asked questions. We want to improve that by trying to make it a little bit lively so that people can engage with one or two people who are able to answer real time any kind of misinformation they may be having. Kanko's key population project has also been reaching out to HIV patients. We went through um, a process of trying to reach out to people even in their homes using the peers and in our health centers so, uh, we have within the um, the static sites, we have a clinician or the counselors who were charged with the responsibility of conveying uh, correct information about COVID as part of their routine um, service delivery. Activists and authorities hope to reach the estimated 1.5 million Kenyans living with HIV with accurate information on coronavirus. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. Displaced Somalis are going hungry as militants cattle According to media reports, Al-Shabaab fighters killed six traders and torched 11 trucks loaded with food aid uh, bound for Hudur on June the 4th. Uh, food prices are surging in Hudur town. Officials say airlifting food and other supplies into the area is currently the only safe way to provide relief. Displaced people in Hudur are receiving $70 uh, US dollars per family, medical assistance, non-food items and food rations. The money and food are insufficient as more people continue to arrive. United Nations reports place Somalia near the top of the list of, of countries with the highest numbers of displaced people worldwide. That is nearly 3 million people, nearly 25% of the population. Climate-related shocks are exacerbating the humanitarian situation in the country. Meanwhile, analysts say that even if security improves, climate-related events like prolonged drought are additional challenges. Around 11,000 people fleeing clashes between herders and fishermen in northern Cameroon are now in neighboring Chad. Uh, that's according to a provincial governor. About 20 people have been killed in uh, what local officials say is Cameroon's worst ethnic violence in recent memory. Clashes erupted last week between fishermen and herders from different ethnic groups over a dispute about holes the fishermen dug in the ground. Officials say the conflict is among the reasons that residents have acquired weapons in recent years, in addition to insecurity caused by Boko Haram and local bandits. Not too far from there, police say gunmen have killed a police officer and six employees of Nigerian oil and gas services company Lee Engineering during an attack on a project site in the southeastern state of Imo. Lee Engineering could not immediately be reached for comment. The attack occurred Monday at a location called Asa, according to Imo State Police spokesman Michael Abatam. Attacks on oil and gas facilities have long been a problem in Nigeria, where the multi-billion dollar industry sits alongside impoverished communities that have seen little benefit from it. The motive for the attack remains unclear. 
A newly elected Zambian president, Hakainde Ichilima, says he plans to unveil a new set of economic policies after his official installation on August the 24th. Speaking from Lusaka, Ichilima says his plans are aimed at jump-starting the economy, tackling a crushing external debt, taming inflation, creating jobs for youth and inspiring the confidence of international investors. Ichilima says his experience as a successful businessman uniquely qualifies him to find solutions to the economy economic challenges facing the country. An African Development Bank report shows the economy fell into a deep recession due to the global cor coronavirus pandemic, contracting nearly 5%. ADB also warned the government to stop accumulating external debt and curb sharply rising public spending to attain debt sustainability. According to the database trading economics, global macro models and analysis, Zambia's unemployment rate is expected to top 15%. The, country of El the county of El Geo Marroquet has produced the bulk of Kenya's 3,000 meter steeplechase Olympic gold medalists. But after a setback in Tokyo, some say it is time to focus on the grassroots. Okwi Oko has our report. At a school in Kenya's highlands, desks serve as hurdles for children who dream of Olympic glory. This is El Geo Maraquet, a rugged hill county in western Kenya. It's produced the bulk of the country's nine Olympic gold medalists in the men's 3,000 meter steeplechase. But earlier this month, Kenya's dominance of the sport since 1984 was brought to an end when Morocco's Sufyan El Bakali snatched the title. We don't have the gym. Our gym is our hills here. Boniface Tiren has coached several of the East African nations' world-beating middle-distance runners. Yes. That's good. He believes defeat in Tokyo will force Kenya to pay more attention to its athletics development programs. It's a wake-up call. We need to go back to the drawing board. We need to come back to our roots where these girls and boys started. And then from there now, we, put, we, we make them not, not to rush. We make them progress. His view is shared by one of the area's most notable athletes, Moses Kiptanui. He's a four-time World Championships gold medalist, Olympic silver medalist, and the first man to run the 3,000-meter steeplechase in under eight minutes. If athletics is called to be nurtured from the grassroots, which means from primary school, all the way to colleges, that is the time we'll have good size but number of at least participating and we'll get the best. For students like Jonah Irot, it's just a matter of time before Kenya is back on top. In, 24, in 2024, we shall prove that we can run better in that steeple chase. But according to Tiren, authorities will need to invest in athletes from an early age in order to overcome the latest stumbling block. Well, that's Oki Oko of Reuters who fired that report. Now, we're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And we're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come. An effort is underway in Hawaii to preserve and review, renew Hawaiian language journalism. Stay with us. Join me on the next Straight Talk Africa as we celebrate the records, the medals and the victories of Africa's greatest athletes at the Tokyo Olympics. We'll look at what it would take to bring the Olympics to Africa. The continent has hosted big sporting events before, but it has yet to land the world's greatest athletic competition. We'll look at what kind of investment would be needed and whether Africans really want to host the Games. Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. 
Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on BOA. The government of Uganda in a statement released on Tuesday says it has not yet reached a decision on a request from the United States to temporarily shelter refugees from Afghanistan fleeing after the Taliban takeover. The East African nation has a long history of receiving people escaping conflict and currently hosts about 1.4 million refugees mostly from South Sudan. However, Albania and Kosovo have said yes to a U.S. request to temporarily take in Afghan refugees seeking visas to enter the United States. U.S. President Joe Biden says it is no longer the United States' responsibility to fight in Afghanistan's civil war, despite disturbing scenes of the Taliban taking control of the capital city of Kabul. Biden is warning of swift retaliation if the Taliban attacks any remaining U.S. personnel and Afghan allies as the nearly 20-year conflict comes to a close. VOA's congressional correspondent Catherine Gibson has more from Washington. The United States' longest war ended in fear and chaos as the Taliban overtook Afghanistan's capital city, prompting an evacuation of personnel from the U.S. Embassy and dangerous last measures by Afghans desperate to leave the country. Despite those scenes, the President of the United States said he stood behind his decision to withdraw U.S. troops. The truth is, this did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. So what's happened? Afghanistan political leaders gave up and fled the country. The Afghan military collapsed, sometime without trying to fight. If anything, the developments of the past week reinforce that ending U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan now was the right decision. American troops cannot and should not be fighting in a war and dying in a war that Afghan forces are not willing to fight for themselves. Republicans and some Democratic lawmakers swiftly condemned Biden for failing to anticipate the speed of the Afghan government's collapse and the potential damage to U.S. credibility worldwide. This will be a permanent scar on the Biden administration's um, presidency. It doesn't mean it'll be a failed presidency. Um, it doesn't mean that in the end most people won't come to accept the fact that um, Withdrawal, it's my view, withdrawal was not only inevitable, it was the right decision. As the Taliban takes over governance of Afghanistan, analysts say the U.S. still has economic leverage in a country that is dependent on international assistance as well as traditional counterterrorism operations. Our options now include making sure the Taliban understand that if they get in cahoots with al-Qaeda or ISIS, or if they even indulge the worst of their own uh, misogynistic and sectarian behavior and uh, retaliate severely with violence against other Afghans, that we have options, we have military options to make them pay a price. But the State Department confirmed Monday the U.S. no longer had a presence at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, and the Pentagon said 2,500 U.S. troops were supporting efforts at the airport to evacuate personnel including thousands of Afghan allies who helped the United States but are still awaiting U.S. visas to escape Afghanistan and almost certain torture and death at the hands of the Taliban. The U.S. military remains focused on the present mission uh, to facilitate the safe evacuation of U.S. citizens, SIVs, and Afghans at risk, to get these personnel out of Afghanistan as quickly and as safely as possible.
an uncertain end to a war that cost the U.S. trillions of dollars and often lacked a clear definition for victory. I will not repeat the mistakes we've made in the past. Mistake of staying and fighting indefinitely in a conflict that is not in the national interest of the United States, of doubling down on a civil war in a foreign country, of attempting to remake a country through the endless military deployments of U.S. forces. Since 2001, four U.S. presidents, two Democrats and two Republicans have struggled to end the influence of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Biden said he would not hand over the United States' longest ever conflict to a fifth commander-in-chief. Catherine Gibson, VOA News, Washington. Hundreds of Afghans living in the United States gathered Sunday in front of the White House to denounce the Taliban's takeover of Kabul. They called on the U.S. and the international community to help Afghans. Viewers for Hunda Payman reports. Afghans have gathered in front of the White House to protest the fall of Kabul to the Taliban. Protesters say that they want their voices to be heard. We are all here to make our voices heard, the least that we can do for Afghanistan and our people. Kabul fell to the Taliban late Sunday as Afghan President Ashraf Ghani fled and the Afghan government collapsed. Protesters say that they are concerned about the Afghan people who will be living under Taliban's harsh rule. My heart hurts for the people of Afghanistan. It hurts for the women and children in Afghanistan. Jim Shidi says the Taliban return to power will erase the gains of the past two decades. All the hard-won gains of the 20 years were lost in two months. It took the Taliban to capture all the country in two months. The thing that bothers me the most is the silence of the international community. Protesters blame the hasty withdrawal of U.S. troops for the Afghan government's collapse. They call on the international community to help Afghans. We want them to help people who have suffered 40 years in the war and do not let what happened to them some 20 plus years ago. The U.S. sent around 6,000 troops to secure the evacuation of its diplomats, nationals and Afghan allies. Farkhanda Paimani, VOA News, Washington. Shock, horror, sadness, anger, and fear. These are some of the emotions members of the U.S. Afghan community are expressing as they watch the fall of the government in Afghanistan over the past few days. Viewers Julie Tabo reports. It's been, it's been heartbreaking, and we're very angry. Scenes from Afghanistan, family members calling for help. The past few days have been devastating for Afghan Americans like Gazelle Omar, a writer and business owner in California who watched helplessly as the U.S. closed its embassy and Taliban insurgents took the capital. A lot of us are still processing this. Um, I feel like it's a crushing betrayal of the Afghan people. Some Afghan Americans went out over the weekend to protest, to ask fellow Americans to pay attention. Some who worked in the country for the U.S. government or organizations that help Afghan people say they fear gains made over the past 20 years will disappear. People never thought of this day will ever come back again, uh, that some non-elected government will be coming back to the country and they were taking over the power. Uh, it's, you know, it's everybody's in shock. I haven't slept. Uh, since the beginning of this uh, unraveling of the government. Um, I feel very hopeless uh, for the first time in a very long time. Parishta Tayeb works with Afghan refugees in New York. She's struggling to process that the Taliban, who ruled the country from 1996 until 2001 as a fundamentalist Islamist regime, are back in power. The most heart-wrenching thing for all of us was to see that our flag was changed and um, another flag was placed, uh, we will not accept that flag. We will not accept that to be a representation 
of Afghanistan, and we will never accept a reign of terror or this regime. But Obaidullah Sadakat, who worked with the U.S. military in Afghanistan for eight years, says the only way forward for the U.S. and the international community is to work with the Taliban. All the 50 countries that were helping the Afghan government, they have to think it is still Afghan government and try to talk to them and have a great communication with them. Moshkan Wafik Alokozai, who lives in the U.S. state of Virginia, doesn't know what will happen to her education academy, which provides online classes and professional training for Afghan women. While the Taliban are saying that women will be able to pursue an education, that wasn't the case when the group last ruled the nation. I did request our international community, please, rescue my country please help my people please do not leave them alone julie tabo voa news hawaii had a thriving native language press through the 19th and early 20th centuries now there is an effort and a way to preserve and renew hawaiian language journalism viewers michael sullivan reports from honolulu honolulu civil beat a nonprofit online news site posts a weekly Hawaiian language section for those who understand or are studying the language. While at Honolulu's Bishop Museum, more than 100 newspapers from a once thriving Hawaiian language press are being digitized, preserving publications from the 1830s to the 1940s. It's part of a revival of a language with few remaining native speakers, says one reporter. There are really no words to this feeling of seeing my story being translated into a language for my people that are, my people are trying to bring back. In 1810, the Hawaiian Islands were unified by King Kamehameha I after years of conflict among regional leaders. The nation became literate after American missionaries developed a written language. Their descendants, however, overthrew Hawaii's queen in 1893, suppressing the language. Hawaiian was revived in the 1970s, becoming the state's second official language, along with English. Hawaii's population is mixed. I am Chamorro, which is the indigenous people of the Mariana Islands. And so I'm very familiar with kind of the history of indigenous languages being erased and the challenges of kind of bringing them back and, and helping them flourish. The language is tied to the land, says a teacher. The Hawaiian language is almost like the DNA code that has in it our systems of knowledge, our belief systems, our history. It conveys a way of life. And that's just the idea of, um, you know, working with the land and working with the resources you have available and respecting those things. Reporters want to see the section expand. Uh, that's kind of the dream. <laughs> you know, let's get content coming to us in Hawaiian uh, and then go uh, translate it back. The revival is part of the story being preserved as a new chapter is written. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Honolulu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at viewafrica.com. From all of us in Washington, thanks for watching.